Now, if we look at the person who is in the agitated depression, it's a very different situation. The return to the womb is basically reduction, sort of alleviation of the uncomfortable feelings and bringing a kind of an undifferentiated state. In the third matrix, the resolution in the original situation came by intensification of the tension and kind of a sudden, explosive, catastrophic kind of a resolution, which happens in a messy situation where there is blood, you know, there are other forms of biological material, the, the placenta, the inside of the body comes out and so on. So what we see is that the person who is under the influence of the third matrix does not have the possibility that the person in the inhibited depression is, which is to simply undo that situation, go back to a previous memory, because the previous memory is the second matrix. Nobody would go from the third matrix to the second, because that looks like absolutely hopeless situation. That's hell, the second matrix. But what that person has available is the memory that after this situation, there was something better, which was the actual situation of coming out. So we are facing a very interesting kind of paradoxical situation that we were born anatomically in the original situation because we are here, we got out, but we really haven't completed it emotionally. So inside we still have the memory of the difficult stages. The little crying that the child does after birth does not really adequately process that tremendous event. So what we do, for example, in experiential therapy is belated processing where we catch up somehow fully consciously with the awareness that we are already out of that situation because deep in the unconscious we still feel caught and trapped. So the circumstances of the birth process are used as a kind of recipe for the psychological completion of the process. Now, this means sort of bringing the situation to some kind of catastrophic resolution where it's sort of instantly over and it is a messy situation. So this would then lead to things like firearms or driving the car over the cliff or jumping out of the window, harakiri, those kinds of things. The impulses for uh, hanging seem to come from a strong unconscious memory of choking in the birth canal where the person is trying to exteriorize those feelings. In some sense, as destructive as it is when it's acted out, there is a kind of distorted healing impulse because if the person could have these experiences in a protected environment where it's an inner experience rather than it's acted out, it would actually lead to liberation. It would lead to a kind of a deep dynamic shift from the third matrix to the fourth matrix. So they psychologically now would be in a frame of mind which was more like being out of the birth canal rather than being stuck in it. So if we now sum it up, we will find out that people who are suicidal actually do not want to kill themselves. This answers the first question, how come people ignore the self-preservation instinct? It's really not about killing oneself. People want to reach either the postnatal state of mind or the prenatal state of mind because the second and the third matrix are so uncomfortable. But if we do it as adults, as in kind of an experiential psychotherapy, as I mentioned before, those experiences will not be just a replay of the original situation, but they would have a kind of numinous quality so that the experience of the prenatal state would not be just being the fetus in the womb, but there would also be a feeling of mystical oneness, of cosmic unity and so on. It would be a spiritual state at the same time. And in a similar way, the experience of being born or reborn is also a kind of psycho-spiritual experience. There's a sense of connecting with the numinous dimension. So from this perspective, they don't want just to reach the prenatal and the postnatal situation, but they actually want to reach the spiritual dimension. So we can see suicide as really a result of a kind of unrecognized craving for transcendence. What people who are under the influence of the third matrix want is not suicide but egocide. They want the ego death that would actually be a kind of a preamble for a powerful spiritual opening and spiritual 
reconnection. So it's a kind of a tragic misunderstanding and failure to read correctly the impulses that are coming from the unconscious. And this would result also in a new strategy in relation to self-destructive suicidal patients. You would not tell them when we are seeing them that they are sick, they are depression, and this is why they feel that they want to die. We would sort of see the need to die as an authentic sort of psychological need. So the approach would be actually to help them die, but do it safely, sort of show them that they can have the experience of death followed by rebirth, and that to have the experience of death, they don't have to hurt the body. They would sort of move out of that state. And actually, after having the experience of dying, they would feel much more alive and much more connected to life. Now, the question is now, how is mania related to depression? Why do we talk about a bipolar disorder? We have seen repeatedly, particularly in the psychedelic work, but occasionally in the whole topic work, mania come as a kind of a symptom or an indication of incomplete rebirth. People would be struggling to be born and there would be a kind of a partial opening, but the process would not be complete. And at that point, people would refuse to continue. I remember situations from the psychedelic work, particularly when it's very marked. And a person now is, you know, forcefully euphoric and would start praising the program. He said, this is incredible. This is a wonderful experience. Everybody should have it. You know, we'll go and give it to the politicians and this is going to change the world. And where's the telephone? I'm going to call all my friends and we're going to throw a party. We're going to celebrate. This was a you know, great experience. And at the same time, when you watch them, you see that it's not genuine happiness. They certainly don't want to analyze where they are or receive some kind of instructions what they should do, which of course would be to go back into the process and complete it because they're kind of like halfway out. So we can say that the inhibited depression is basically the influence of the second matrix, which is a system which is completely closed and feels like an absolute no exit situation. The agitated depression would be a situation where the energy starts sort of partially flowing out and the manic state would be one step beyond that when now you still have this activity which you have in the agitated depression or even more, but now instead of getting depression, you get kind of this forceful kind of caricature. There's one more category of issues of disorders that I would like to explore and those are problems involving sexuality, which means sexual dysfunctions, aberrations, deviations, perversions, you know, whatever terminology we want to use for that. And this is, I think, particularly interesting because of the importance that Freud attributes to sexuality in psychology. One of his major contributions was actually an essay on sexuality where he brought up the thesis of the libidinal development, the oral, the anal, urethro, phallic, and he made a link there between perversions and neurosis, that somehow acting out the what he called the it impulses, the impulses of the instincts associated with the unconscious, uninhibited acting out would lead to perversions, whereas neurosis could be seen as a kind of a defense and a reaction formation against these kinds of instinctual libidinal impulses. Now, he had quite a few problems in this area. His initial conceptual framework implied that the most powerful motivating force in our psyche is what he called the pleasure principle, which is the need to pursue pleasure and avoid displeasure. And then around the year 1913 or so, he became aware, very, very strongly aware of the fact that there are quite a few disorders where this explanation simply doesn't apply. And the most blatant example was, of course, masochism, where there are people who want to be tortured, they want to suffer, they want to experience pain, they want to be abused. There are people who mutilate themselves, there are people who have the compulsion to confess. 
and in the extremes there are people who kill themselves. So all these problems, you know, could not be easily interpreted as pursuit of pleasure. And he became aware of the problem, and he started thinking about it. He wrote a book, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, dealing with these issues. 